All right, Psalm 41. As I've been going through these psalms, you know, just when you think it can't get any better, just go to the next one, and it's just awesome. I'm really excited about the sermon tonight. Uh, there's a little bit of, of um, you know, another, another prophetic reference that's mentioned in the New Testament. We're going to go over that here in this psalm. And, um, you know, overall, you know, a lot of these psalms have themes of their own, which makes sense anyways, especially being songs. You know, they, they kind of have common themes. And this is just a real basic one of good versus evil and and even just tying in just the basic concept of Jesus Christ and, and the people against him and his resurrection and everything else. So uh, this is a really cool psalm. I want to get in this. There's a couple points I want to focus in on. One is starts off here with just in this first verse. The Bible says, Blessed is he that considereth the poor. Blessed is he that considereth the poor. Look at the next few uh, verses there. The rest of that verse says, The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive. And he shall be blessed upon the earth. And thou wilt not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing. Thou wilt make all his bed in his sickness. So the level of care and the blessings that God gives for the person that considers the poor is immense. I mean, look, look at these things again. We're going to look at this one more time. When you consider, and I'm going to get into what it means to consider the poor. And we're going to look at other scriptures about this. Okay, it's, it's not on the surface level what a lot of people might think, but uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I can't understate the, the amount of blessings that God gives for the person who's considering the poor. It says, the Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. So if you consider the poor, the Bible's saying here, hey, when you're in time of trouble, when you've got bad things happening, God's going to remember that and he's going to deliver you out of your troubles because you've considered the poor. This is the Lord will preserve him. He's going to help you to continue. Right? He's going to keep him alive and he shall be blessed upon the earth and thou wilt not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. So basically God's saying, I'm going to stand up for you and I will defend you and I will help you preserve your life because you are considering the poor. Verse 3 says, The Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing. Thou wilt make all his bed in his sickness. So even in times when you get sick, God's going to give you some more strength and he's going to help you through those rough times. Now, some of the reasons why I believe that God is blessing in this way is because for one, the poor is an easy group to target and take advantage of and, and to just be the, the victims of, of crimes and, and just to have evil, wicked people, you know, doing wicked things to them. They're, they're an easier target. Why? Because you don't have any resources to really fully defend yourself, right? This, you know, Today, of course, we know it takes a lot of money. If you, if you needed to go to court for some reason, if you needed to defend yourself, it's, it costs money just to, even, you know, even if you're innocent, it doesn't matter. You know, you have a big burden to have to go in, and go to court and defend yourself. And this isn't something that's like brand new to American society of, of people, um, of having a cost associated with, with having to defend yourself. Okay, this is something that's been around for a long time. And considering the poor goes way beyond just giving money to someone who doesn't have money. Right? So when, and that's why I said it's not necessarily what you think of necessarily on the surface. Considering the poor doesn't even necessarily mean giving them money. But when you consider the poor, you're considering their situation, you're considering their cause, and you're going to consider them in righteousness and in righteous judgment. Now, I'm not saying that it has nothing to do with ever giving money to the poor. That's, you know, I'm, not, I'm not saying the opposite, or right? I'm not just saying like, no, no, and you never give money to people who are poor. In fact, we're going to see plenty of verses that talk about that. I just want to make sure that everyone's clear that it's not just about that one thing. And I also want to make sure you understand that the poor is not equal to the bum. Okay, the poor is not just a synonym for a bum, for an able-bodied man that doesn't want to work, that has every capacity to be able to go out and earn a living for himself, 
but has chosen to do drugs, has chosen to drink, has chosen to just fall into the gutter. That is not who the Bible's talking about here. For the, that's why, you know what it is, though? It's, it, that's why it doesn't just say, just give all of your money to the poor. It says, consider the poor. Now, people who are bums may end up being very poor, but you consider. And what the Bible says in Proverbs 29, 7, the righteous considereth the cause of the poor. There's a cause. Now, not all the poor are poor because they're bums at all. There's plenty of hardworking people. There's plenty of good people out there that are poor because they don't have a lot of money and for many circumstances and many reasons. So it just doesn't mean you don't just look on everyone who doesn't have money as being, you know, any less of a person, first of all. And second of all, as, as if they're lazy or, or bums anyways. You don't just look at people that way. But if when you consider the cause and you consider why is this person in a situation, then you can make a righteous judgment on that. But here's the thing, putting the bum aside, because the Bible says this, you may not like it, what do you mean calling people bums? Hey, the Bible says that if a person's not going to work, neither should he eat. And you know what? That's not Old Testament law. That's New Testament. Not that I would put that much of a difference between the two anyways, but you know, people who want to say, oh, that's Old Testament. No, it's not. That's 1 Thessalonians. Okay, read the Bible. If any man's not going to work, neither should he eat. So if someone's not going to work, but they're poor, that doesn't mean just give them a bunch of money so that they can eat. No, it's better for that person not to eat so they can get to work. Amen. Now, obviously, there's situations where people can't work. People who are maimed and injured and, you know, and have other problems that is going to prevent them from working. And you know what? Those types of people, you see them in the Bible. What do they do? They go to the temple. They go to the house of God. They're going to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And you know what? That's the right place. And, you know, it's funny because I talk to people about some of the things that happen that you, you don't always realize happens when you're, you know, when you pastor a church or if you're the one answering the phone calls for a church. Because there's a lot of people out there that want to view church as their personal ATM that they have no responsibility for. They just want to call up and be like, hey, can you just give me some money for my rent and give me money for my bills and just give me, you know, just give me, give me, give me. Okay, that's not what the church is for. Now, our church is generous and we will help people that are truly in need, but we're going to do it the right way. We're going to do it the biblical way. And this is not just a place just to call up, run down the list in a phone book or just go online and see where all the churches are. And I'm just going to call up and see who's going to give me money. Sorry, we're not going to support you. And in fact, the Bible has a lot of serious requirements. I mean, you think about widows, right? And most of the people who call our church are young, young men and young women. In fact, I, don't, I cannot think of one time I've ever had an elderly person call the church ever asking for something, asking for money. I can't, I can't think of one. I may be mistaken about that, but it's not coming to my mind right now, and it would probably stand out because every voice, and obviously you can't see the person, but the voices you can tell a lot from. You're not hearing a shaky voice on the other end from an, as an, from an elderly person. And that speaks a lot because you know what? The Bible says that the church is responsible for taking care of the widows, but it also puts a lot of limitations on who those widows actually are. It's not just any widow. It's widows who are widows indeed. Widows who are widows indeed, there's an age limit. They've got to be over 60 years old. They have to have no other family that can help support them. So not just their husband died, but children. Hey, children, honor your father and mother. Take care of them, right? That's your duty to take care of your parents when they get old. But some people are in a situation, maybe they've lost children, maybe they never had children, right? And, and, they find, and their, their husband dies, their spouse dies, they end up being, becoming a widow and they're not able to support themselves. But they've been, they've been good, they've done the right thing, they've washed the saints' feet. The Bible says it gives all these various things that it talks about they're faithful, you know, they're faithful in prayer, they're faithful to church, they, they've, they have a, a good heart, they're a good person, but they need some help. Those people get help from the church. It's not just everybody who just has a need 
well, church is just going to pay for it. No. Now, that doesn't mean that individuals can't just help other people out in different situations that don't fall into those categories, but who God puts under the responsibility of the church. You know, when it comes to widows, that's the, that's the criteria. So again, you know, I'm trying to be careful with how I express this, this truth here is that, you know, there's nothing wrong necessarily with you helping anybody out in particular, but who, the, who God says the church is responsible for, he puts specific requirements on that. And I think we can use that as a biblical principle to learn, hey, if God is doing this, maybe we should be doing that too and who we choose to help out financially and let's consider and let's seriously consider the person, consider the cause and consider everything and then make a judgment call on whether or not we want to help out that person. And I've done this in the past too. People who are willing to come to church and see, I have no problem saying this online either. This will go up online because I know people who are asking for money aren't going to be watching the sermons anyways. But <laughs> I have my own policies where, you know, at least if, so, if someone's calling up and asking for money, I don't ever promise them money, but I invite them to church and I, and I tell them, hey, what you, what you need is something. I know you think you need money right now. And I've said this before. I know you think that you need money right now and that's what you need. I said, but you need something more than money right now. Come to church. I'd like to talk with you. You could come to our church. You can, you can visit our church and see what we can do to help you. And almost 0% of the people show up. And in fact, they oftentimes will get angry with me on the phone and hang up. But there is a cause and I do want to help. And I don't just say those things to sound like a jerk on the phone or to be rude. I genuinely mean those things because I would like to help people. But unfortunately, so many people that find themselves in these situations, they're poor and they're going to be, keep being poor no matter how much money you give them. The money isn't going to solve the problem for them. So the people who seem to find enough money to pay their cell phone bill and to smoke their cigarettes are calling church for the people who work hard here that are giving, you know, for God's work to be done. And then you're going to come and have the gall and ask for our, you know, for their hard earned money. And you're puffing away on cigarettes and you're buying beer and you're paying for your cell phone and saying you need this money for your kids or you need this money for your electric bill. No, you don't need money. You need to get your priorities right. You need to get in the Bible. You need to learn what the Bible says about, about how you're supposed to live. And if you can get this down, that'll help you for a lifetime. Then you truly can find yourself in a situation where you may not end up, you know, having to call up people and call up churches and begging for, for money and food. And I do want to help people like that. But I want to do it the right way. Now that I got that out of the way, there is also a great benefit for helping people financially and helping out the poor. Okay, and I just wanted to make sure it's clear, you know, we kind of get a clear idea of, of, of who it is that we're, that we're talking about and, and what the Bible's teaching about all this stuff. Because we're going to see quite a few verses just about the poor in general and helping them out. And, and financially, yes, is another one of the ways of doing that. The Bible says, uh, I already quoted this verse, you could, you could turn to Proverbs if you'd like to, of course, keep your place in Psalm 41. Proverbs 14, you could turn to. I'll reread Proverbs 29, 7. The Bible reads, The righteous considereth the cause of the poor, but the wicked regardeth not to know it. So wicked people don't even care. And they, say they don't want to know anything about it. Whatever, you're poor. And wicked people view poor people as just less than human, as people they don't have to care about because they don't really have a voice. Because what are you going to do anyways? Right? And that's, that is an attitude a lot of people have. They just don't care. You know, God cares. The righteous consider it the cause of the poor. Proverbs 14, verse 31, the Bible reads, He that oppresseth the poor reproacheth his maker. And again, remember I was talking about considering the poor. This is, this is going towards the line of, of, this is talking about oppressing, right? The oppression of the poor, where people are doing 
things to, to harm or to hurt or just to keep down. A pre, you know, think of pressure or press. You're, you're, when you're pressing, you're, you're pushing down. You're trying to keep people down. And, you know, part of the oppression of the poor is exacting usury on people. Yeah. You got poor people who don't have money to begin with and they're trying to borrow some money to, to be able to live and, and do what they need to do. And then you're going and charging interest on those people. That's oppression. I mean, if they, if they were capable of paying back more than they owed, they wouldn't be going to people looking to get a loan and get, get a little bit of money to, to, to help them get things figured out in their life. That's oppression. He that oppresseth the poor reproacheth. You're bringing a reproach against God. I mean, remember that. And, and see, when you have this mindset of thinking that, oh, well, poor people, they don't really matter that much. I just walk all over them and, and who cares? Your reproach unto your maker. But he that honoreth him hath mercy on the poor. If you honor God, you'll have mercy on the poor. And again, you know, showing mercy. Maybe, maybe you are in a position where you have more wealth and then, you know, and people might owe you money and they're poor or whatever and, and you know, you show mercy on people like that. You, you, you give them a little grace. You show them some mercy. You show them some forgiveness. And that honors God. Turn to uh, Proverbs chapter 19, verse number 17. The Bible reads, He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given will he pay him again. So this is talking about literally giving things, right? Lending uh, to the poor. So it says if you have pity upon the poor and you lend, you're giving them something. It says you're lending to the Lord. You're not lending to that person. You're actually lending to the Lord because the Lord is taking care of them through you. And you're doing that in, in a sense for God by helping out someone who's poor. And it says he that hath pity on the poor lendeth unto the Lord and that which he hath given will he pay him again. And I mean, what a great, what, what another great reason. I mean, if you think about it, what the Bible is saying here, when you're giving unto the poor and to, you know, to help them out, you're going to end up getting that back anyways. You don't really lose anything by helping people. Because you might think like, oh, well, I'm never going to see that again. Right? I mean, they can't pay me back. They're poor, whatever, and, and, and great, you know, and you should have a good, cheerful heart and God love with a cheerful giver and you ought to be able to, to just give to people to help them out, if, you know, people who are in need. Um, and lend unto that person like you're lending to the Lord, but then the Bible still gives us a promise. You know what? God's going to still pay you back. Because God's saying, you know what? I'm going to take care of that person. Thank you for lending unto them. Now I'm going to take care of you too. Uh, flip over to chapter 28. Chapter 28. Verse number 27. Proverbs 28, 27. The Bible reads, He that giveth unto the poor shall not lack, but he that hideth his eyes shall have many a curse. So again, the Bible is saying, you know, if you give unto the poor, God will make sure that you're not lacking in any area. So you don't have to even worry about, you know, if you see a poor brother or sister in Christ, you see, you see, you know, a poor person, someone who's in need, and they need your help, and they're not just some bum, right? But you got, you got some poor person in need, God's saying, don't worry, because you know, with a lot of people, you may not be poor, but things may be real tight. And you're thinking like, well, I can't really afford to help that person out. I can't really afford, I can't afford it. I don't have any money. Well, the Bible says, he that giveth unto the poor shall not lack. I'm saying, you'll be taken care of. And you know, on a side note, this is one of the big problems I have with that Dave Ramsey and his, and his uh, you know, uh, Financial Peace University or whatever. Now, a lot of the things that he teaches are good principles and solid when it comes to just kind of managing money and not getting into debt and paying off debt and everything else. Great, right? There's nothing, uh, you know, it's not like I'm against every single thing that the person that he teaches. But one thing that I hate is that, you know, he's basically teaching, you know, you got to get all, you know, pay off all of your debt and everything else. So then you can give to people once you're out, once you've got all that other stuff taken care of. That's not what the Bible teaches. Okay, if you have something, if you have a brother in need and you have that you can lend unto them, that you can give unto them, 
then we ought to give unto them. And the Bible saying that, you know what? God will make sure that you're not lacking. Now, we ought to be responsible and clean up our messes and get out of debt and do all that stuff. But you don't wait and hold back on helping the person in need when you have the means to do so. And, and they're, they're poor. Obviously, there's a big difference in the situation that you're in than they're in. You know, hey, give unto them. Be generous. And don't, and don't just say, well, one day when I have all my debt pay up, then I'm going to give like nobody else. Well, go ahead and give like nobody else that one day. But how about right now, too? You can also be generous and give to people. And if you've got food and, and clothing and, you know, and your family's taken care of, why don't you help someone else who, who, who may not have all that and someone who's in need? Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 15. I'm going to read for you from Luke chapter 14 while you're turning to Deuteronomy 15. Deuteronomy 15. I'm going to read Luke 14, verse number 12. The Bible reads, Then said he also unto him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. For thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. That was Jesus Christ speaking. He said, you know what? When you're going to throw a great feast, you're going to have a big party, you're going to have a lot of food and a banquet, and you're going to invite a lot of people. He says, don't invite your friends and your neighbors and the people who are able to basically kind of be in the same situation as you and be like, okay, well, I'm going to throw a party this month and then you're going to throw a party next month and someone else is going to throw a party next one and it all just kind of equals out and it all washes and you've all just spent the same amount of money overall on everybody else. He's saying, you know what? No. Why don't you invite the poor, the main, you know, the people who, they're not going to have any chance of paying you back. So you invite those people, you be a blessing unto them, you make a big feast and say, hey, come on in. We want you to have some of this. And the Bible says that you'll be blessed and that you will be recompensed or repaid at the resurrection of the just. So at the judgment seat of Christ, he said, that's what you're going to get your reward. Instead of just, just being real generous with all the people that are just going to pay you right back again anyways, why don't you be real generous with the people who can't pay you back? Just like Psalm 41 said, blessed is he that considereth the poor. You'll be blessed. You consider the poor with your feasts. Deuteronomy 15, look at verse number 7. The Bible reads, If there be among you a poor man of one of thy brethren within any of thy gates in the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother. But thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanteth. Now, that which he wanteth doesn't mean that which he desireth. It means that which he lacks. So it doesn't mean, this isn't saying, well, I don't have the sufficient money to buy my second car. <laughs> I'm in need. You need to help me out here, brother. That's what Deuteronomy 15 is talking about. <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's not. Now, and, and you know, I also had another thought come into my mind, too, when I was reading this. Because I brought up the bum. I brought up the people. Be careful not to just misapply and just have a haughty attitude towards everybody and find some little fault in every single person's life to just justify why you're never going to give any money, anybody any money and help anybody out. Okay, watch out for that. Because while, yes, I do think we should take a, a strong stance against just supporting people and their bad habits, their drug habits, their, you know, and, and, and being able to show tough love in times where it's needed so that they're like, no, man, you want to eat, you need to, you need to work. Okay? At the same time, we ought to also be able to have compassion on others and be able to give and be able to, to, to differentiate between the two. Because not everybody's a bum. Okay, and if you start thinking, well, everybody, whoever is ever in need of money, they're in it because they did this and they did that and they did, and you're just like judging everyone that way, there's something wrong with you. Because otherwise, all of these verses wouldn't make sense then. If there's just never anyone that you can come across that ever would have a legitimate need. 
Now, I will admit, in a rich country, it's harder to find people who are legitimately, like, in need. I have a hard time thinking that anyone's in need that's possessing a cell phone. I have a hard time with that because you're paying a bill. And I don't mean is possessing some old, you know, one that, that nothing's being paid for at all on it. I mean, like, you're carrying a bill every month and paying for something that is a luxury. Okay, and you have luxury items and, and cable TV and subscriptions online and whatever it is. Okay, <laughs> that is not someone who is in need. You get rid of all of that stuff. And, you know, and I brought this up to someone else before too. When you're going out to eat, I've talked to people who have had money problems and, and, were, you know, and, and people I care about. I'm not going to mention any names because I don't, I don't want to embarrass them or anything like that uh, in case they're listening. They're not here tonight. But uh, you know, people that I've, I've, I've helped in the past to get them to realize when you go out to eat, you are paying for servants to bring you food. The, that's why they're called servers. They serve you. And I don't even care if it's fast food. You've got someone in the back cooking up a meal for you. And it's being brought, even if it's in a paper bag, up to the front for you. And they're serving you that food. You can purchase food cheaper. And it'll last you longer if you go and buy it yourself and either cook it yourself or buy stuff that doesn't need to be cooked or whatever, you know, rice and beans will sustain you a lot longer and will get you a lot farther than McDonald's will or Burger King or whatever. And look, when you're in a situation where you're going to consider yourself to be in need, it's tough times, but you know what? Make the best use of your resources. And, I, and I'd rather help people when I see them taking the efforts necessary than just, man, you're just going to go and blow all this. But that's also why if people need help and they come to church, you can counsel them. And you can help people. Because sometimes, like the person that I'm thinking about, it never even occurred to them. Thought never crossed their mind. But you know what? That person was humble and received the the admonition and it was gentle I wasn't being rude to him or anything I don't think there's it didn't deserve it but when people can grow and listen you know what that's considering their cause and that's actually helping them out and now they have a new mindset of thinking oh okay well I can do something different and it's going to actually overall help out my situation and that's what we need to be doing and thinking about now but the Bible saying here Verse, let's look at verse 8 again, Deuteronomy 15. Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him. Wide means be generous. Okay, if you're going to help someone out, help them out. Open up your hand wide unto him and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need and that which he wanteth. Beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying the seventh year, the year of release is at hand, and thine eye be evil against thy poor brother, and thou givest him naught. And he cry unto the Lord against thee, and it be sin unto thee. Thou shalt surely give him, and thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him, because that for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works, and in all that thou puttest thine hand unto. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy in thy land." Now, I brought up this, the seven years, uh, or the, year, the seventh year, the year of release. This is talking about, and I don't want to get into this too much, but bond servants and, and people who basically, they're in need and they need money. And basically what they would do is they would give them what they need and then they would work it off and they would work off a debt and pay for it. But at the seventh year, they let go free. Okay. So what he's saying is don't have this wicked heart going, man, next year is the year of release. And this guy's coming to me now in need. I'm just going to lose all. I'm not going to get any. I'm not going to get very much work out of that person before I have to just forgive the debt. 
And he's saying, you know what? That's wicked. Don't give like that. Now, obviously, in this context, this opening up your wide and hand and wide and giving him is lending because it's in the context also of people paying that back through labor or just paying it back. And we ought to pay back. If you ever find yourself in a situation where you're in need, right, and someone helps you out, you ought to try to find a way to pay those people back. You know, and, it may, and we know it may not be immediate. Try to, try to pay them back. It's the right thing to do. But you know what also, on the, on the flip side, the person who's lending, lend like you're never going to see it again. And don't hold, harbor bitterness and, and don't grudgingly help them out. Give unto them. And you know what? God will take care of you. Flip over to Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah 58. Man, this point is going a little bit longer than I planned. <laughs> but there's, there's a lot here. There's a lot of content just in, in considering. Because you see all the blessings in the first, you know, the first three verses. It talks about blessing the person back in Psalms, um, blessing the, the poor and considering the poor and all the blessings that come along with that. But this, this concept of considering the poor is found all throughout Scripture. Isaiah 58, verse number 1, the Bible reads, very famous passage, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression in the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast ye find pleasure and exact all your labor. So just real quickly go as we go through this, you know, verse number one is God talking to Isaiah and saying, Hey, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their sins, right? He's saying, Call out their sins. The people have this concept of they'll say, oh, they seek me daily, they delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. So they have this, this you know, um, appearance of being very spiritual and they're coming to them say, oh man, we want to know the ways of God and everything else. But then, and then they say, hey, why are we fasting and you're not seeing it? Why are we afflicting our souls and thou takest no knowledge? But then he says, behold, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exact all your labors. The day of fasting was supposed to be a day of, of like affliction and, and, you know, and he's saying, you know what? You're just taking delight and pleasure and everything else. That kind of goes against what the fast is about. But then continuing on here, because it's not just about like a fast isn't just about checking off a box and saying, oh, I fasted today. Like the, like the, the guy that was, that was real proud and say, I fast twice in a week. You know, I give tithes of everything. And then thank God I'm not like this, this poor man over here, right? Looking down on the poor person. And he didn't go away justified because of all of his boasting and his pride. But, um, that's not the purpose of the fast. Verse number four, let's keep reading here. The Bible says, Behold, ye fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. He's basically saying, I'm not accepting your fast. Yeah, I'm not hearing your fast. Because you're wicked, and you need to have your sins exposed, and you sound all spiritual and stuff, and oh yeah, we want to follow the way of the Lord, and look, we're fasting, how come God's not hearing us? Because you're fasting for debate and strife. You're fasting for the wrong reasons. You're fasting this way. But look at what he says here. <coughs> when it comes to fasting, and this has more to do with just the spirit than the mechanism of fasting. Verse number five says, Is it such a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Verse six, is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and that ye break every yoke? Is it not 
to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house. When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. He's saying, you know what I'd much rather like to see than your fastings, than withholding food from yourself? How about you get rid of your wickedness, and how about you start doing righteousness? And some of the things he lists here as doing righteousness, hey, why aren't you, why aren't you taking your bread and feeding the hungry? Why aren't you bringing the poor that are cast out over to your house and helping them out? Why aren't you, when you see someone who's naked and in need of clothing, how come you don't cover them? And you have this concept and this idea that, oh, we're so spiritual and we're made to fasting and, you know, how come God's not hearing us? And they have all of these other problems and he's like, I'm not going to accept your fast. Verse number eight says, then shall thy light break forth as the morning, meaning then if they did all these other things that he mentioned, and thine health shall spring forth speedily and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy rearward. Then shalt thou call and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry and he shall say, here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke the putting forth of the finger and speaking vanity. And if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. It's, it's the pharisaical attitude. Because what did the Pharisees do? Jesus said, you know, hey, you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law and righteousness and judgment, right? And I know I didn't get those in the right order, but they had, the Pharisees had this concept and this attitude of going, well, I'm paying tithe. They pay tithe on the smallest amount of things. Well, at least I'm paying my tithe. But they're wicked. Right? And they have no consideration for the poor. They're, they're, they're oppressors. They oppress people. They have these, these, these beams coming out of their eye while they're judging, trying to judge the smallest of matters on other people. And they've got everything backwards. And they can follow through to a T those, those ritual things, the fastings. Right? But they've got these huge problems. And God's saying, look, get the righteousness part right and get the wickedness out of your life and you'll already be blessed. I'll already be listening to your prayers, let alone from doing a fast after that, right? I mean, this is what you really need to be doing is getting that right. Proverbs 21, 13, the Bible reads, turn back if you would to Psalm 41. Whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. So if you just say, well, I don't even want to deal with this. I don't want to know anything about it. I'm just going to ignore it. Your time of need is going to come. And guess what? You'll also then be finding yourself crying and no one's going to listen. Because you reap what you sow. Psalm 41, verse number 4. Man. All right, I'm going to try to get through this. In a timely manner. Verse number four. I said, Lord, be merciful unto me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. Mine enemies speak evil of me. When shall he die and his name perish? And if he come to see me, he speak vanity. His heart gathereth iniquity to itself. When he goeth abroad, he telleth it. All that hate me whisper together against me. Against me do they devise my hurt. And evil disease say they cleaveth fast unto him and now that he lieth, he shall rise up no more. And this is speaking of now the enemies of David, of the psalmist here. It starts off in verse number one, talking about the blessed person who considers the poor and, and all the great blessings that God will give. And the reason why I think he's bringing this up is because I believe that David was considering the poor and was a good man at heart when it comes to things like this and, and having the right attitude because he's saying, I know that you're going to bless and now I'm in a time of need. Now I have, Lord, be merciful unto me. 
heal my soul. I, you know, he's, he's, he's confessing sin. He's, I've sinned against thee. And now I've got my enemies speaking evil of me. And basically, he wants to be recompensed for the good that he's done for helping other people out now because now he's in a time of need and he's going to the Lord's. And, you know, all these problems. My enemies are speaking evil of me. When shall he die and his name perish? And if he come to see me, he speaketh vanity. Right? He's just lying. Because that's what the enemy likes to do. They'll go and talk to you and just say flattery or just, just empty words to you. They're speaking vanity. His heart gathereth iniquity to itself. When he goeth abroad, he telleth it. Verse 7, All that hate me whisper together against me. Against me do they devise my hurt. And evil disease say they cleaveth fast unto him. And now that he lieth, he shall rise up no more. So they're just saying all kinds of, you know, kind of nasty things about him. But in that last verse, or verse number eight that we just read, is, is bringing us into this prophecy of Jesus Christ. Um, these types of wicked things were also said about Jesus Christ himself. And oftentimes what you'll see is there, there's not necessarily always a clear line distinguishing when does the, the prophecy start and stop because the concepts here, first of all, are all um, true all throughout time. But then we have, you know, these specific things. So let's just get into verse number nine. He says, Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. So this, now that he lieth, he shall rise up no more. I believe he's talking about the death of Jesus Christ, saying, all right, now that he's finally dead, he's not rising again. Of course, he did rise again. And then this is, verse 9 is definitely uh, a reference to Judas. And this is quoted and referenced in the New Testament. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 13, because that is where this... Uh, scripture is quoted in the New Testament, this verse number 9 of Psalm 41. John 13, and as I was preparing for this, I knew that this verse was quoted in the New Testament, but I started to see a lot more, and I spent, there's a reason why I spent a lot of time with the poor and the blessing of that going into this, because th there's kind of a lot of really cool things that, that Hopefully you'll be able to see. Hopefully I'll be able to express and, and say the way that I understood them, you know, and understand them. Uh, let's start reading in John 13. We're going to get the context here. Go back to verse number 10 in John 13. The Bible reads, Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. Now, this, of course, is talking about when Jesus was, excuse me, washing the feet of his disciples at the Last Supper, is the context where we are in John 13. And let's just keep reading here of John 13, verse number 11. For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet, and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If then your Lord and Master have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. And this is a great teaching that goes Again, beyond the physical act of just washing your feet, but if you think about the physical act of walking, washing someone's feet, it's a real humbling act. And it's something where you are not putting yourself in a position of being over them and too good for someone else and too good to help someone, no matter what the problem is. Because if you're willing to get down on your hands and knees and wash people's feet, they've been walking around, it could be dirty, smelly, whatever, right? Not a, not a very pleasant place to be around someone else's feet and to help them and to take care of that need that they have, right? Jesus is showing them the way, saying, I'm willing to do this. I'm your Lord and Master. He says, you say that, you're saying right, because I am. Yet here I am, your Lord and Master, getting down on my hands and knees and taking my garment and I'm you know, wiping off and cleaning your feet. And he's giving them that example. And I believe this ties in perfectly, especially as we get into this, with the consideration of the poor. And considering them. 
And not just going, oh, I'm above that, and oh, I'm, you know, they're beneath me. Hey, Jesus wasn't beneath washing his disciples' feet. And he showed that by doing that. And to give them, okay, look, you've seen me do this now. Now you do that. And that goes to the heart. You need to have that type of an attitude that is humble and not looking down on people and not treating people, you know, poorly. Poorly, right? Like they're poor. How about we don't treat people like that even if they are poor? Verse 15, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Now look at verse 18. I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come, that when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. So now he's tying in this one verse that's quoted from Psalm 41. But the teaching goes and encompasses all of Psalm 41. I think it ties into even just this reference in John 13. And he brings that in and he's saying, you know what? I'm telling you about this now and I'm quoting this scripture to you now. So when it comes to pass... You know, that, hey, one of you was, uh, you know, he that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. When this happens, and you see this happen, you're going to realize, wow, he was right. He was betrayed. Someone's lifted up his heel against him. He that eateth bread with me, as they're eating bread right there at that Last Supper, and Judas is right there. He's saying, he that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. He's saying, now you're going to know, because he's fulfilling more scripture and more prophecy, now you're going to know that I am he. Also another great proof that when he says the I am he, he's referring to the I am he, God of the Bible. What's also interesting to note is that Judas didn't care for the poor. Flip back one chapter to chapter 12 in John. And we see some more similarities. John 12, verse number 3. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus. So in the chapter preceding, we see Mary washing Jesus' feet and anointing his feet with ointment. In the next chapter, Jesus is washing his disciples' feet. And look at this, it says, and wiped his feet with her hair. Talk about an act of humility. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? He's spouting off like he cares about the poor. She's doing this humble act. She's bestowing honor upon Jesus Christ. She's washing his feet and wiping them with her hair. And all he's coming out and saying, oh, well, why wasn't this just sold and given to the poor? And look at verse 6. It says, this he said, not that he cared for the poor. He said he cared for the poor. He didn't really care for the poor. But because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Then Jesus said, let her alone against the day of my bearing as she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. We read the blessings of those who love the, the, the poor and care for the poor and consider the poor and the curses of those that don't. Judas, we're going to get to this in a minute. Judas was a devil. Turn if you go to Genesis chapter 3. Remember the verse that we're focusing on in Psalm 41. I'll reread it for you. Psalm 41, 9 says, Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. 
It's an interesting phrase there, too. He lifted up his heel against me. Well, there's another interesting phrase here found in uh, Genesis chapter 3. Look at verse number 14. The Bible reads, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. He hath lifted up his heel against me. Now, this was a curse given to Satan under the serpent in the garden. And he says, I'm going to put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. You know what the two seeds are? the Son of God, and the Son of Perdition. De the Judas was a child of the devil. Turn to John chapter 6. I'll prove that to you. John 6 verse 70 Bible reads, Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. And elsewhere he's called the son of perdition. He's a child of the devil. He's lifting up his heel against Jesus Christ, going all the way back to that same curse on, on Satan himself. It's amazing how all of these passages fit together. Isn't the Word of God great? Amen. That's right. I mean, but this is just man's work, right? Just men, they were, they were able to see the level of detail and to be able to fit all this together and weave it in so perfectly together throughout ages. No. No. This is the Word of God. Not only do you have the themes completely in sync with each other, with the poor, with the humility, with the, you know, the oppression, and then the, with the, just with Satan and Jesus. I mean, every single aspect of this, and even just the references to the heel. Lifting up your heel. I mean, it's just tying it all together so perfectly. Man cannot produce truth like this. <laughs> I mean, this is just, just amazing. Let's finish off the chapter here, verse number 10. I'm going I'm to close it here. But thou, O Lord, be merciful unto me and raise me up that I may requite them. I think Jesus Christ was raised up and he did requite them and he will requite them when he comes back. By this I know that thou favorest me because mine enemy doth not triumph over me. And as for me, thou upholdest me in mine integrity and settest me before thy face forever. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting and to everlasting Amen and amen. It's a great finish. And you know, when he says, I know thou favorest me because mine enemy doth not triumph over me. Don't apply, you can't apply this in the short term. There's going to be some small battles that you may lose. but we know that the war is going to be won and in the end, the triumph is going to go to the righteous. The triumph is going to go to those that God favors. The sons of God. Those that believe on his name. I said at the beginning, you know, I, I prepare and then read and study these these. Psalms and it's like 
you know, they're exciting. I hope you get excited too. I don't know. I, I hopefully I could do as good of a job at, at expressing the things that I've learned from Scripture to, to help you out. But I mean, every chapter just never ceases to amaze me. Um, keep reading these too. Um, you know, I, I encourage you while we're going through these, read them before, read them after. They're not that long, most of them. I mean, you can read these Psalms before you come into Wednesday night Bible study and then afterwards because, you know, oftentimes you'll pick up on even more. And people are usually coming up to me afterwards and be like, yeah, and this and this. And it's like, yeah, I wish I would have known that before. <laughs> I included that with the sermon. But um, yeah, these, these are a great blessing. And let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all of the great truths, for the wonder that's in your word. Um, Lord, we thank you for preserving your words for us just perfectly and that we can have full faith and full trust in you. God, thank you for opening up all these great truths of the scripture tonight. And I pray that you would continue to bless us and, and increase our knowledge. Lord, help us to have good discernment and have a proper spirit and to be able to um, consider the poor and, and, and be helpful and, and be able to lend and, and not have a, a wicked heart, but that we would um, be able to, to lend it with a, with a wide hand and be able to just uh, help and he be here to, to be a blessing unto others for you, dear Lord, that, that we could lend unto you when we, when we help other people out and help us to, to not um, lack in our faith and to just trust that, that if we, um, that we could remember all these verses that, that we read tonight and know that, that we won't lack by um, being able to help those that are in need. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.